There's no way to overstate this. Judas Priest are metal gods. This British band formed all the way back in 1969, created this thing we now call heavy metal. They gave us the huge anthems, the leather and studs. Every metal fan can pick out Rob Halford's voice and the twin guitars of K.K. Downing and Glenn Tipton. Through the years, the band had their ups and downs, but every new album is something for the metal tribe to celebrate. This week, they released their 18th studio album, Firepower. So we're looking back at their career and asking, what's the best Judas Priest record of all time? Today on Lock Horns, it's a debate on the essential albums of Judas Priest. Welcome back to Lock Horns, coming to you live from the Banger Hangar at the illustrious Banger TV uh, studios. A reminder, if you are watching this in the archive, we do go live. And if you subscribe to Banger TV, you can get those notifications. All right. Many of you know that it's Judas Priest week here at Banger TV with the release of the brand new record. And this week on Lock Horns, we are going to be digging into what are the top five essential Judas Priest albums of all time. And to help me with this enormous task is arguably the man who knows more about Judas Priest than any other living human on the planet Earth. Martin Popoff. Hey, Sam, how are you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, Thanks no pressure. But yeah, I, really I don't know. I don't know about up. that, but let's uh, let's give it a shot. Good sure. to see you. Good to see you. So, uh, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about how you got into this band. Well, hi, junior high, thirteen years old, working at Rock Island Tape Center, a record store. Um, Sad Wings of Destiny came into the store, and uh, you know, looked at it. It looked heavy it looked like it might be some sort of strange christian rock album it had the religious writing on the back and all the song titles were kind of strange like that so got it home and uh you know all of m myself my buddies you know we used to make those little rock lists all the times top tens judas priest absolutely upset all our top tens new kind of vocalist amazing riffs it was literally as we would learn later and fortify later you know formulate later mm -hmm. it was the album that reinvented metal for the first time since really the beginning of metal 1970 right. with Sabbath and Deep Purple. And I gotta get this question in, was there one thing in particular that you <laughs> felt that Priest was doing better than any other rock or metal bands either at that time or to this day? Yeah, I, absolutely at that time I would say it was the vocals. I mean, hearing Rob Halford, I mean, he, he essentially uh, invented that big operatic, technically amazing vocal. Mm -hmm. You know, you could talk about Freddie Mercury or Ian Gillen or even Ozzy having a high voice, but this was technically amazing. And the riffs were just this massive improvement even on Black Sabbath or Deep Purple. It yeah. was just very, very technical and cool and twin leads and everything. Yeah. Well, I think this is going to be fun. I think a lot of people forget how long this band has been around, formed yeah. all the way back in 69, and a massive catalog to weigh through. So we've got a lot of work to do today. Well, this is how it works. We want to hear from all of you what you think are the top five essential Judas Priest albums of all time and why. We want to hear your well-formulated statements on why it is essential. And we've got a lot of people joining us from around the world, so let's get to the board. Here we go. We've got some Brits joining us for their countrymen, Judas Priest, coming uh, from Norfolk, London, Cheshire, and Bamber Bridge. Uh, we've got Yank regulars from Connecticut, Texas, Ohio, California, Oregon, uh, and Wyoming. Canucks, we're getting all the we're getting all the nicknames in here. Toronto, Victoria, my hometown, yeah. Barry, and then internationally, we've got folks from Brazil, wow. Lithuania, Lebanon, Switzerland, Germany, Chile, Turkey, Australia, Paraguay, Iceland, Macedonia, and Wakanda. Nice. Welcome Wakanda. <laughs> Welcome all uh, to uh, to Lock Horns, and of course, the most important person joining us today is our intimate, an intimate producer. Lisa Latasur. Hi. Hi, Sam. Hi, everybody. How are you? Martin. Uh, I'm really good, actually. I'm, I'm stoked for this. Uh, I'm hoping there'll be some good locking of horns. No. And uh, always happy to have no. Professor Popoff in the house. No uh, offense to you, Sam. No, no offense taken. <laughs> I'm a maiden guy. We'll get to that later. Whoa. Judas Priest shirt. Nice shirt. You got Thank the you. shirt. <laughs> Not trying to influence anyone. Just saying. Just skewing it slightly. Yeah. but And, and we've got a, the, 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 the subtask today right. is to have the viewers uh, tell us what unifies all those uh, record covers. Yeah, so we always have a theme behind me. Sometimes it's color, sometimes it's not. Uh, today it's not color, uh, but there is one thing all these bands have in common, and Sam couldn't guess, so uh, feel free to uh, chat about that yeah. amongst yourselves. Stump the done. 
So tell us about the polling. Right, so if you haven't been here in a while, we're now using YouTube polls to settle debates because the chat can sometimes be crazy and uh, we really do want it to reflect what you guys want. So if you go to YouTube, Banger TV's main page, click on the community tab, I'll put the URL in the chat, you can participate in the polls. There's one up now about the legend and also about the newer albums and we'll see what comes up during the chat that we might need to take a, a rush poll for as well. Excellent. Well, let's get into this. So, as we mentioned in the outset, this is a band uh, who means a lot to metal, uh, to the metal community, uh, with a deep catalog and has been around for a long time. And Martin <coughs> is going to attempt to give us a bit of a mini history here okay. on uh, <laughs> Judas Priest, No Pressure. Yes. Uh, go ahead, Martin. What's the story? Okay, well, they're from Birmingham. They started way around the corner here in 1969, leading up to this first album, Rock and Roll, in 1974. These two records came out on Gull Records, so a little small label in, in England. They um, basically didn't do anything. This one did come out in North America, Janus Records. That's how, how my or, um, label my, uh, my copy was on. Mm -hmm. Then they signed to CBS. They, they're, they're getting a little bit bigger. You're starting to see some ads in the magazine, circus and stuff. You know, I got this as a new release. We were waiting for that one for the first time. And this, this period is considered this, this massive, almost immortal, I think one of the greatest runs of creativity in all music, not even just heavy metal. The only band I can equate to is Queen mm. uh, during the 70s. Does it They're, start with this record? Uh, no, I'd say it start starts with, with this okay, record and maybe with ends Wings. with this record. Okay, so you're moving right. along. Um, this record is 1978 in England called Killing Machine. Then it was uh, Hellbent for Leather, 1979. But here, um, this is the album where they started getting a little more of the heavy metal image, um, the leather and studs. Uh, it was getting just a little more aggressive. These are very sort of thinly, austerely produced. They're almost like intellectual Judas Priest albums. This is their big breakthrough album, of course, um, Living After Midnight, um, Breaking the Law. Um, you know, metal's getting big. We've got the new wave of British heavy metal starting. You know, this is called British Steel. It's almost like Metallica calling themselves Metallica. Yeah. And right? arguably ushers in kind of what we might call the populist era. Yes. Priest, yeah. maybe for the next four records They get or so. really big with yeah. this. They have they falter with this. It's a little bit poppy. Um, a lot of people don't like it. It's almost like the, the weak T version of this one, but they come storming back. The new wave of British heavy metal is still happening. Uh, this is a huge album. It's got um, you got another thing common in Electric Eye. So it's uh, they're also moving into a little more of an 80s production sound. The drums are simpler. They're getting a little more electronic. These two are kind of a pair. This is almost like the heavier, darker version of that. Just the same way the the album covers. They're massive by this time, right? This is like they're they're a big you know arena rock band. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're headlining. Um, they're they're in there with all. Ozzy and Scorpions and Maiden and all that. They're yep. just one of these big bands. So then they put out the hair metal album. This is the hair metal era. Um, Turbo is uh, is quite poppy. A lot of people didn't like it. There was a big hit with Turbo Lover. This album did lousy. No one likes it. Um, it's it, it. You know, one of the big secrets about it is is the drumming on it is all electronic. It's mm -hmm. not even Dave Holland playing drums. It was. It sounds like a phoned in album. It's a reaction to this one. They kind of react a lot with their with their catalog, um, and then. But it's pretty heavy. And then you get to Painkiller, um, which we'll talk about a little more in detail, but Scott Travis is the new drummer. He kicks them in the butt. He really, you know, raises the rhythm section as you go on. Mm -hmm. Then we enter the dark period. Uh, things go south very quickly. Rob Halford storms off in a, in a, in a huff. He gets, uh, you know, he's playing in Toronto as part of that Operation Rock and Roll. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he comes out on his bike and he gets whacked off the bike with, uh, with like part of the stage or something. And he never talks to the band again for years. Uh, that's it. He leaves he goes off and starts fight. Um, so Priest basically is, goes quite a few years before they come back with these two, two albums here, this pair, uh, starring Ripper Owens from Cleveland, who was in a, a um, Priest tribute band. Yeah. Those albums are on a small label. This is, uh, you know, e e equates to the Blaze Bailey era of, uh, of Maiden. There are so many parallels, but they're, they're actually playing large clubs again by this point. Mm -hmm. um, but they're really heavy. They're kind of humorless. People don't like them very much. The production is harsh. Rob Halford comes back. Um, you know, after having this great Halford career as well, but the same way Bruce Dickinson comes back yeah. and, and uh, sort of the same time. I mean, yep. This is a little later, but um, basically this album was fairly well received. It's a conservative album. Um, people liked it at the time. I don't know. I, I think it's going to do okay in the polling. Um, you move on. They put out their first concept album ever. It's a double album. 
nobody likes it very much. I mean, it's it's essentially got kind of crappy production. Um, everything's a little, you know, the story's a little forced, um, but people aren't crazy about it. It's an hour and 40 minutes long. You move on, um, KK's gone, and, and Richie Faulkner is into the band, and here you get just, again, a, a, a squarely rocking uh, Judas Priest album. Uh, it's kind of the comeback. It's it's the short, it's a single album. Mm -hmm. They're still playing live. Um, they're still a headlining band. Yep. They're doing okay. Uh, and that brings us to Fire Power, which right. uh, we're going to find out. I mean, a lot of people, I, I me in, in, uh, included, find this uh, you know quite an improvement over this, and yep. it's, it's a, quite an amazing album. But um, the sad news at this point is that Glenn Tipton has announced that he has Parkinson's yep. de uh, disease, so he's he's out of the band now. Um, but he was in on the writing on this record, um, but he won't be touring it. And we've got Andy Sneap in as the guitarist yep. now. So right. so there it is. I mean, they were a massive band. Um, you know, they they went through their lean years all the way up to here. They never made any money they had a lot of trouble with the, the management company of, of that but then they had the massive 80s you know they were in there participating but just like when metal died in the 90s they had their period when yep. it was a big trouble for them but uh, now they're back <laughs> now I warned you that this guy knew a lot about Judas Priest and there's proof I think you all officially owe Martin Popoff $20 each for that lecture on, on the, uh, the, the deep it. history of Judas Priest but thank you for that okay. that's very helpful what an incredible career and so many ups and downs and as you say some interesting parallels with Maiden and other kind of classic British bands in terms of uh, their peaks and their valleys in yeah. their career enough about that time to move on what's really funny is that the chat really slowed down during that entire section like <laughs> people actually stopped talking because they were listening so yeah. um, good job which which Lisa knows how rare it is that <laughs> it the chat board ever actually happened. goes quiet okay next order of business let's get moving with a lot of work to do and not a lot of time what we do first off in our essential albums Lockhorns um, uh, debates is we define the legend and my understanding, Lisa, is leading up to today's show. There is some, uh, there's a unanimous feeling out there. So uh, we had a YouTube poll. We used to pick the legend here at Banger, and uh, sometimes it made a lot of sad faces out there in the chat. So now we let you pick the legend, and uh, you picked Pain Killer, which is a shock to some of the people here in this room. We'll bring up the graphic uh, and show you how you all voted for the Essential Legend album. All right, we're gonna go to the graphic showing the vote. The graphic is not coming up. We'll, we'll trust <laughs> us, we'll bring the graphic back and uh, we'll take a minute to digest this information that you all want Painkiller uh, with a clip yeah. from Painkiller. How let's, about we do that? Let's do that. Well, damn, if that ain't metal, I don't know what is. Let's go right to the board and let's see what people have to say who think that Painkiller should be the legend album of Judas Priest. Here we go. Rybread28 says, Painkiller is their best album hands down. Best vocals, best guitar playing, best drumming, best production, best everything. Will Aguilar says, Painkiller was a big step. Everything up to that point was just metal. Painkiller was a little thrashier groove. The vocals were taken to a place where Rob hadn't taken them before. This album stood out where grunge was taking its form to take over the world. Fucking incredible. Thrash Maniac 99 is back. Painkiller helped culminate Priest's sound that started on Stained Class. The faster songs, great melodies, crushing riffs, pounding drums, and the soaring vocals helped to create a heavy metal or roller coaster ride. Greg Bourne says, just when people thought all the thrash bands were king, uh, were king, 
Priest just comes out and says, hold my beer. Love it. Comment of the week so far. And Stian Golden says, Google should put this album as their number one answer when someone type in heavy metal in the search bar. The reason, of course, being that it, it sounds like a chainsaw eating its way through a wall of steel. This album is perfection. Wow. Oscar Barroso, it just continues. Before I was introduced to Slayer, Death, etc. Painkiller was a whole new level for me that was enough to make me say, holy shit, what just happened? Matt Monroe, catching my breath. Painkiller equals all killer, no filler. Every song on it is a priest anthem. Wish they could play more of it in their live set. Wow. Okay, Martin, weigh in. <laughs> what are your thoughts on Painkiller as the legend? Well, okay, I mean, first of all, it must be gratifying for these guys to have an album, you know, way up after a few evolutions, uh, you know, be so beloved. That's sure. really cool, um, because this is like way deep into the catalog. Um, to me, Painkiller was that record that was the Try Harder album. You know when bands would uh, all go to Vancouver, the hair metal bands, to make their Try Harder album? It was White Snake, Motley Crue, Aerosmith, right. Bon Jovi, where they said, we gotta really fix things because grunge is coming, we're sounding very irrelevant. Priest had that same kind of moment. It wasn't a go to Vancouver moment, but it was because of Ram It Down being you know, ill-received. It didn't have a drummer on it at all, as we were saying. And similarly, um, Turbo being questionable album. Yes, I mean, so, they've so, been yeah. out of the running for, for, for exactly. Exactly. Wow. People are kind of ridiculing them. So they do get a new drummer and, and he makes a big difference, Scott Travis. But the other big thing about this record that's important is it's produced by Chris Tangerides, who recently died a, a couple mm. months ago. And he was, he was a, a friend, acquaintance of mine. I'm sure a lot of people feel that way because he was a super nice guy. But he produced Tigers of Pantang yeah. and Y&T. He came from that, that heavy background. It's an incredibly well-produced album. It sounds amazing. Yeah. And it is super heavy and it's got a lot of life to it. Um, the one thing I don't like about it so much is I think the lyrics are, you know, as as the comments have said, this this should be under the under the you know the name heavy metal because it is so heavy metal in the lyrics right, in the right. album cover and stuff yeah. like that. But just as as an additional note, um, I did a book called the Top 500 Heavy Metal Albums of All Time in 2005, and it won then too. So it's like this isn't just a new thing. I know this is a youth thing. That's what's happening right. here because basically it's the new generation of metalheads saying saying their piece because you know a lot would have picked something in here or a lot would have picked something in here um, so basically what we have is uh, is just a, a really cool try harder album and an album that's super heavy I don't really buy that it's it's you know really you know, needs to be in there in the uh, we invented thrash kind of thing right it's not really that Slayer's already doing a much better right. job but uh, well, commendable. Let, me, let me weigh in here I mean I think you made just a good point I mean this is a very unique case where the legend is kind of coming at the midway point test you know and you got to give kudos to priest that, that the fans feel that way uh, admittedly, like you, I was surprised uh, that this was the this was the choice. Maybe showing my age, or maybe just my wisdom. I often get confused which is which. But I uh, would have put my money on a, on an album much earlier in in the catalog. But as you say, bringing Travis to the game, and I think you also nailed it with with the production. There's there's they they've clearly modernized the sonics of yeah. the band. Uh, obviously, the drumming made a big difference, but in terms of just the 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 sonic quality of the record, it's a it's a pretty massive step up from from where they've just been. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's going to be a long show, <laughs> guys. <laughs> <Settle in. laughs> uh, two things. One, we are going to bring up that graphic in case some of you don't believe us. This right. really did happen. Most of you voted for Painkiller. And Sam's going to read, uh, we will give uh, a voice to the people who uh, think that was stupid. Yeah, okay, here we go. Painkiller. We got Jacob Holub who says, Painkiller was the end of Classic Priest. Not essential at all considering their history, even though it's one of their best. Josh Snover, Painkiller is a classic, but nowhere near a lot of the older material in terms of uh, being the legend. Uh, Vodka Violator says, Painkiller does not uh, does only work for the kids, not for the older fans. Uh, Sack Blabbeth 65, is this for the kiddies? Uh, Celtic Frost 1979, too new, it's 28 years old. Uh, Celtic Frost 79 also says, I'm sorry if Painkiller is too heavy for you. Go listen to fucking Point of Entry. Point of Entry, uh, well taken. Anyway, uh, no shortage of, of opinions. I, I think we are locking horns on this. I'm going to quote me as Painkiller should not be the legend album uh, for this illustrious band, Judas Priest. My money is on a couple of other ones earlier in the catalog. But hey, I'm just here to direct traffic and make sure people get along most of the time so let's let's move on um it's your turn 
Okay, what? Since you think Painkiller <clears throat> shouldn't be the legend, <clears throat> uh, we always uh, do a guest choice, Martin. Right. Uh, What's your guest choice for Judas Priest? Absolutely, without a doubt. I mean, I love a lot of Priest albums for a lot of reasons, but it's never been any uh, album other than this in all the years, 50 years or whatever it is, 40 years, Killing Machine. Okay. Um, I just love that um, it's, it's the culmination of everything they were building up to with this trio of albums. It's absolutely... Um, authoritative heavy metal it's it's almost like you know these are these are the the armchair university uh records where it is they're they're just working quietly in isolation and this is the the aggressive we're coming out we know we're making some of the greatest music ever i mean i i was thinking about it on my way over here and i i have no problem saying delivering the goods burning up uh rock forever even Evil Fantasies and Killing Machine would be in my top 10 Priest songs of all time. Yep. Uh, it's just a well-sequenced, well-recorded, it's got some, some really good guitar tones on it. Uh, it's got Take on the World for that sort of, uh, you know, uh, new style heavy metal anthem. Right. Even the Dirge Before the Dawn is, is pretty decent on it. So uh, e everything about it, it's just, it's just start to finish, they just tick off all the boxes of being the very best metal band uh, going. I know it's a strange choice, um, but to me, it's that cusp album. It's the last one before things go south, and we will talk about that. Okay, let's talk <laughs> well, about the board. What are the what are the people having to say about Martin Popoff's unconventional guest choice? Here we go. Uh, Mercenin, I like Killing Machine more than Painkiller. You have a friend, Jamie Laszlo. Martin picks weird things as the best. He thinks Bark at the Moon is Ozzy's best album ever. That's really funny here at Banger TV. Uh, Dave with a fire axe standing on a hill of skulls. Awesome. <laughs> Martin, you're off my Christmas list. Oh, dear. Sorry, buddy. A uh, Dale Ed killing machine. Uh, he agrees. Or she. Uh, who else we got here? Lisa Phillip. Uh, oh, just oh. a few more words from uh, Dale. Dale had more than two words to share. Uh, killing Machine features some of the all-time best proper heavy metal songs that are still fresh uh, sounding to this day. Um, and Philip Burry and Martin, yes, Killing Machine, totally agree. Okay, well, so some locking of horns yeah. as we like to do on Killing Machine, but definitely uh, a provocative choice. Uh, Lisa, where are we going next? As you saw in that graphic, there were some other albums that the fans were stoked to see on this list. Mm -hmm. uh, again, how that worked was I threw out a question, what do you think is the most important Priest album? I picked the top five of those right in to make that poll in which Painkiller won. But there are four other records uh, that were quite high on, uh, on people's lists. So we're going to go through some of those. And uh, because I get to pick the order, we're going to start with British Steel. <laughs> all right, British Steel. So first of all, uh, my money would have been on British Steel as the, the legend. I thought well, it would have won too. I, yeah. I, you know, to me... It's not my favorite Priest record, but to me it is It is the beginning, as you said, in your mini history of what many would argue as being the big era of the yeah. band. It sort of sets, it sets a new template that really carries them through, I guess, for, for a decade, which is the 80s. But what I think matters nothing on this show, <laughs> it's all about everybody else. Yeah. British Steel, here we go, Will Jenkins, British Steel is the album. You give uh, someone who wants to start listening. You give it to someone who wants to start listening to Judas Priest. Between the big single "Breaking the Law" and "Living After Midnight," as well as the diversity of riffs that make up the record, it is a staple for the evolution of Priest and heavy metal. Alberto Marenko says this is the album that put Priest on the map. It is everything: melody, catchy riffs, and vocals, and a raw production which is good. Even though I like Painkiller better. There's no denial that this album is more important to Priest and to the metal scene. Jamie Laszlo, British Steel, has the best album cover, but that's about it. Uh, well done, and, and arguably one of the best uh, album titles uh, yes. in, in metal. Uh, it's fantastic. Rye Bread, 28, British Steel is okay, but Living After Midnight and Breaking the Law are so annoying <laughs> now. Can't stand those. I mean, yeah. it, it's true. I mean, give me your thoughts on British Steel. It, it, it's, it's borderline sort of become a caricature or is overplayed. What are your, what are your yeah, thoughts? Yes, so here's where we get the simplified priests. I mean, I've interviewed these guys a lot of times and they, and they kind of do make the point and it, it does make, you know, literally, the bluntness of it is we had to eat, we were starving. 
right? right. I mean, we had to write some songs. So they really simplified. Tom Allen is in as producer. The songs are, are much more, uh, they're simpler. Everything's uh, a little compressed and mid-rangey. But we were horrified when we heard it the first time. Living After Midnight as an advanced single was, that was like a Kiss song, hearing that. Yeah. Breaking the Law was pretty good. But, you know, the, the things I don't like about it, and, you know, we can have this whole discussion about Number of the Beast as well, how there's bad songs hidden in them. Like, the, the two... The two heavy, fast ones on there, I find, are very lazy. Uh, Steeler and Rapid Fire. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's got, you You don't have to be old to be wise, but it also has Metal Gods and Grinder, which are amazing. Like, those are songs which I feel could have been on on this one, and they would have been my favorites, right? So, um, but yeah, we, we basically thought, I, I, all, all my buddies and I, it, it was almost like priests were immortal, and they were doing things that we couldn't believe people could do on a record. And from this point on, they were just, regular blokes making pretty good heavy metal records. Right. It was okay, but absolutely did not love it, and, we, and it was definitely a step down from, uh, from Killing Machine. Man's got opinions, gotta give it to him. <laughs> I would agree with you. To me, uh, you know, I don't want to say dumb it down. That's a, maybe a bit too harsh, but definitely I think the British Steel was, felt like, felt like the Judas Priest radio record. And, you know, we listened to metal because we didn't like what was on the radio. So it kind of was a bit confusing and maybe crossed a line for a lot of us who were uh, fans of the, of the metal underground. Okay, there we go, Lisa. We've got three up on the board. I think the big question is whether uh, Buddy Popoff's killing machine is going to survive. I don't know the British deal is a given. People do seem split, and I don't know why you want to penalize them for writing kick-ass songs that everyone can remember years and decades later, uh -huh. but some people feel it jumped the shark. So I've made a poll, and you can go to the Banger TV YouTube page under Community tab, vote yes or no, and uh, we'll just see later if it makes it into the top five. Okay, well, we got three. There we go. We got Painkillers, The Legend, Killing Machine, Guest Choice, and the, the next one up is British Steel, Judas Priest, which I think going into today's show, we all could have predicted uh, would be in the top five, but we need to move on, right, Lisa? We're moving on, and um, we have a clip now uh, that we did with uh, Derek Green on the 70,000 Tons of Metal Cruise, where he made his pick for uh, the most essential Judas Priest album, and uh, we'll let you watch it, and then we'll come back and talk about Sad Wings. I'm Derek Green from Sepultura, and my favorite Judas Priest album is Sad Wings of Destiny. This album is epic. It really got me into Judas Priest. From beginning to the end, the album is perfection. It was so well written that it really feels like it's a story being told. Um, it always have an impact on me. Um, from the album cover to, to every aspect of the album, the sound, um, I, I think, the band was at their peak at this, for me uh, on that album. So Sad Wings of Destiny, a lot of Judas Priest fans, of course, know, uh, have to know these songs from it. But uh, it's one that some people kind of sleep on sometimes. But it's, for me, the best, hands down. Well, there you go, Mr. Green. Pretty emphatic that yeah. Sad Wings of Destiny cool. deserves to be uh, in the top five essential Priest albums. Uh, Martin, give me your thoughts, and then we'll go to the board. Yeah, well, so this is definitely a pick that the older generation would pick. It's like the Led Zeppelin IV. It's like the Black Sabbath Paranoid of the 70s albums, right? Um, but it is a historic, amazing, important album because it was such a step up from rock and roll. Uh, as I was saying in, you know, when we were talking earlier, I mean, it literally is the, the first super smart reinvention of heavy metal. It basically overhauled heavy metal and made heavy metal smart um, for the first time since metal was invented with Black Sabbath, Paranoid, Paranoid and Deep Purple in Rock and Your Eye Heap's first album. Um, so basically, um, everything about it, the production's amazing, the playing's great, the lyrics, it's serious. Um, you know, all the songs are very general and timeless and, yeah. and you know, mysterious, as is the album cover, as is the title, as is the logo font. Um, you know, at this time we had... Uh, uh, Led Zeppelin, Physical Graffiti, Black Sabbath, Sabotage. The other yeah. big one that would have been a competitor to this would be something like A Rainbow Rising. Right. Um, but yeah. we had UFO, Thin Lizzy. Mm. Over in America, you had Aerosmith Rocks was big, Kiss Alive. Right. But this is basically the first super smart... Uh, and the other amazing thing about it is it's just a band coming out of nowhere that sound like they're incredibly, um, you know, like like... Jimi Hendrix dropping out of the sky right. with all this knowledge. Right. It's a little bit like Merciful Fate Melissa or, yep. or Sabotage's yep. first album where just out of nowhere comes the best. Yep. 
And that's the way we felt about it. And immediately, priest for years and years, well, until British Steel was, no one, no one was smarter. Yeah. We'll go to the board. I, got, I can't resist weighing in. I think in tr one thing that's interesting about Sad Wings of Destiny, people forget how metallic, how metal this record is up against all of the other bands and albums yeah. you just mentioned, which are basically all some version of hard rock. Yeah. I think we forget that Judas Priest really is on the tip of the spear in terms of ushering a totally new sound. The other mm -hmm. thing that's interesting about Sad Wings, I think it's kind of become... I don't want to sound too cynical, but the cool record to kind of go back and rediscover. I know a lot of people, mm -hmm. this is their favorite Priest record, yeah. but they were not listening to this record when it came out. Yeah. They were either too young or weren't even alive yet. So it's yeah. kind of become that cool record to go back yeah. and discover, wow, this is kind of where it all came from. Yeah. Anyway, let's get to the board because there's lots mm -hmm. of comments. Um, Mercenant says, Sad Wings has to be the legend. Probably is the most influential metal album ever after Sabbath's first few albums. That's a big statement. Uh, Chris Ty is here. Uh, up to this album, no band has released had released a classic metal album and enthusiastically called themselves a heavy metal band. Uh, if it ain't uh, if that ain't important, I don't know what is. And we talked about that in Metal Evolution, right, Martin? About yep. this priest is really the band that that in a lot of ways creates a concept of heavy metal and really it takes ownership of it. Uh, Tom Tanaka, I was born in 1990 and I still think the legend should be Sad Wings. There you go. Yeah. It's just one of the great masterpieces of metal. It's it's like the diamond in the rough that so many young people have gone back and discovered. Yeah. Uh, Runago says uh, Sad Wings is the best album of the first era. Those crazy vocals in uh, Dream Deceiver, I don't think uh, I don't think there's another song where Halford shows his vocal range from bottom to top. Good point. Riff Power 2112 says best part about Sad Wings was the piano ballad showcasing Halford's lower range vocals. Interesting that people are picking up on that. Everyone talks about the Banshee yeah. upper register. Take a uh, breath vocals. here, Sam. Yes. <sighs> <laughs> and go. Javid Nurula, Tyrant, Ripper, Victim of Changes, Dreamer Deceiver, Metal Classics, and Influential. Listen to the scales on Ripper, then listen to Slayer. Listen to the victim listen to Victim of Changes and see where early Metallica was influenced. People talk about British Steel with the anthems, but the songwriting, the riffs, the soaring vocals and screams, the dark subject matter, <clears throat> the artwork, it's all there on Sad Wings. I mean that pretty much nails it for me. Yeah. I was thinking that people were going to pick um, Sad Wings as the legend. Yeah. Uh, Metal Pearson J, Sad Wings became irrelevant. The second Unleashed in the East came out. Why is Unleashed in the East not on the board? Question mark. Machine Gun Etiquette 9. Sad Wings is the priest album for hipsters and old fogies. <laughs> there you go. So basically, banger TV. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Target market. Uh, well, there you go. I mean, a lot of opinions. Uh, kind of, I guess, uh, resonating with what we're saying, but um, I think all in all, it's like it or not, I think it's a lock on legend or not. Mm -hmm. It is unquestionably an essential album of the band's yeah. catalog. Lisa, I need you. I got to take a breath after that long rant. <laughs> uh, That's okay. Where are we going next? Well, let's. We can take a clip. We can go to a clip. Uh, but I do think it's a lock <clears throat> on Painkiller and Sad Wings at this point, leaving three. Spots to yep. be decided. Uh, right now, it is overwhelming. Yes, on British Steel. Okay, uh, but you can still vote in our poll. Sorry to interrupt. Are we f officially pulling out Killing Machine, or we're going to leave it up there? We'll leave it for now. Leave it for now. <laughs> leave it for now. But okay, if you one want, spot left, and there's you four want million killing, albums to yeah, choose yeah. from if you across want, the rest of the catalog. <laughs> uh, anyway, sorry, Lisa. It's okay. If you want Killing Machine, you better say so, because Martin's kind of uh, <laughs> alone on the hill up there. I'm okay if it goes. I understand. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> uh, but we are going to go to another clip, uh, also shot. Uh, on the 70k cruise with Patrick Jensen. Sam was very sorry that he didn't get to ask him this question, but we did. Uh, what's your favorite uh, Judas Priest album? And he said, Screaming for Vengeance. Here's the clip. I'd go with um, Screaming for Vengeance, actually. I guess that's, it came out at the time when, you know, when you are 13 or 12, you know, when you're the most impressionable, I guess. But uh, that album just to me sounds loud and it, um, Defenders is also a good album, but it's, it has a more contained sound somehow. Another thing coming, Screaming for Vengeance song, might, the Screaming for Vengeance song might be the most aggressive song they've ever written. You know, even more so than Painkiller and so on, just because it's the sound, the riffing, the, uh, the um, uh, dynamics in between the songs, like songs like Fever and Devil's Child, uh, I mean, Electric Eye. I mean, how can you, you can't go wrong with Electric Eye. 
So yeah, and it, I even love the yellow artwork on the album. Everything is perfect. He, the band looked their best at, at that point of time too. So yeah, yeah I love Screaming for Vengeance. My man, Patrick Jensen, take a break and go listen to Witchery. There's arguably no better thrash band that's kind of yeah. taken a little piece of Priest <laughs> and thrown it down, uh, yeah. thrown it into Witchery. the thrash filter. Love those guys. Yeah. And uh, I'm fully transparent, totally on board with Patrick here. I think it's partly age and generation, but Screaming for Vengeance for me was the right album at the right time. Uh, people forget, I think, that Electric Eye like it's in two words i mean that song that intro concept people forget that no one was really doing that in the same way how many metal albums since screaming for vengeance start with an epic minute and a half sort of almost orchestral instrumental opening the template was set with this record and again the artwork arguably arguably the best metal album cover ever made maybe because it's yellow but anyway, uh, where am I going next? I couldn't resist Martin or the chat. Lisa, help me uh, out here. There's a lot of people in the chat with a lot to say, so we'll, we'll get through as much as we can. Okay, Screaming for Vengeance. Tyler Phelps, the chorus on Screaming for Vengeance is the most powerful thing Priest have ever done, and the opening track is the best opening track ever. This is, the mo this is more than a legend. It's a blessing. Nicely put. Tracy Pham, this album is timeless. I might be a little biased towards the album because my dad showed me this album when I was young, but listening to it now in 2018, it still holds up. Prog Master 666. Six, six. Screaming for Vengeance would have to be the most essential album, in my opinion. The album is a great middle ground for the fans who like uh, the more popish songs see, uh, seen in British Steel and the fans who like the super heavy metal songs with blistering riffs on albums like Sad Wings and Hellbent for Leather. Electric Eye, to me, is the best, heaviest song in the Priest catalog. LJ260, if you don't like Screaming for Vengeance, it's their best. If you don't think Screaming for Vengeance is their best, sorry, I hope someone staples your balls to a plank of wood and chops off your left pinky. Why the left pinky? I don't want to overthink that. Oh, oh Andrew Voorhees, hard call, but I nominate Screaming for Vengeance. I think it has uh, two of the best Judas Priest songs, uh, The Hellion, Electric Eye, and You've Got Another Thing Coming, uh, The High Watermark of Priest, uh, Most Successful Period. And lastly, uh, Bolverick 66 boldly states, the list is complete. Show's over? No, Martin, tell me what you think about this record. Well, there's a lot of crap on it, you know? There's Take These Chains, there's Devil's Child. I'm thinking you got another thing out, coming I'm is out, that great, right? I mean, uh, oh, our 80s band, we actually played that song live. You got another thing coming. But no, the the, um, that I the intro to it is incredible. I mean, obviously with the Hellion and Electric Eye, one of their greatest songs ever. Yeah. Bloodstone, Riding on the Wind. It starts so strong. Um, and I'm also a little bit down on the title track, too. I know it was groundbreaking and it was super aggressive for them and stuff. I love my favorite moment on the whole album besides the yellow album cover which I love too is is there is this cool little melodic break in Screaming for Vengeance uh, it, or, uh, yes the song um, it, it lasts very shortly and then it goes into something else but I, I loved it it reminded me of the super intellectual smart priest there isn't much of that on here I mean mm -hmm. really Electric Eye is an incredible song but it is again we are you know we're looking at a band of mortals here they are not they are not the men's mad metal makers of right. the 70s anymore Right. Um, the production's pretty good. Um, it's it's definitely the correction after Point of Entry. Yeah. Point of Entry was very poppy, very weak. Uh, you know, there, there's just a. It, it's almost like they were trying to be a little bit too adult, mm -hmm. and that bodes not great for here because now we are moving into the primary color Judas Priest, where it right. is for kiddies, right. right? That comment was very you know about painkiller. It's that's the one thing I don't like about it too much is it's a little bit like now we're we're our target market is 14, 15 years old. All right, hit that cowbell. This Steam is now officially okay. coming out of my ears. But this, I love it. It's this, a great album. This too. will be continued <laughs> over a pint of beer in the banger bar following uh, today's today's episode. Uh, strong opinions. Uh, yeah, definitely some good insights there. And at least we agree on the yellow fucking cover. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> let's move on, Lisa. Let's uh, we got it. We, we got we got we got a lot of records to get through here. Yeah. So we had a, a few controversial, uh, what I think may be controversial fan choices. Uh, votes for Turbo. Mm. So, uh, tell us what you think about that in the chat, Martin. Well, Turbo. Okay, so I think I heard a pin drop there. <laughs> that was awkward, <laughs> but now you got to fill the space too. <laughs> well, okay. So this record, I mean, obviously there are a lot of people who like it quite a bit. I find it a a friendly, user friendly kind of album, and it is it is kind of cool in a lot of ways. I mean, it has. 
very, very interesting guitar tones. It has a little bit of what you call synthesizer guitar. I think the track Turbo Lover is incredible. Reckless is incredible. It's almost like one of those records where there's three or four songs I hate so much that, that it highlights the other ones and make them, makes them even, even, uh, even cooler sounding. So there's some really kind of interesting songwriting. I love the Melodic Priest. It definitely is akin to Point of Entry. It's almost like Point of entry is the analog version. This is the 80s version. The production, I like this production better than Defenders and Screaming. I, I just, I really don't like that 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 uh, turgid drum sound, mechanical drum sound that they were getting there. This is a little brighter. Um, so I do like the production, but I hate songs like Private Property. And, yeah. Oh, there's there's a lot of crap on it too. Right. So there you go. Anyway, it just might be possible that Martin Popoff likes Turbo better than Screaming for Vengeance. No, 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 no. And this is the day I may quit <laughs> not that of my day job, <laughs> just for that reason alone. But anyways, I'll try not to get too distracted yeah. and get to the board. What do mm. people have to say? Dale N. says, Turbo over Painkiller. There I said it. Metal uh, Person J. Turbo greater than Point of Entry. I, I think you get some agreement there. Soup Soup says that Turbo gets a bad rap but I have a soft spot for 80s hair metal, so of course I enjoy the kind of silliness of Turbo. It shouldn't be essential, but it should not be forgotten. This is the great revisionist moment yeah, of Judas absolutely. Priest the history happening right now. Uh, Paolo Pinkel, um, Turbo is not unlistenable. Good double negative. <laughs> Better than a lot of the older, uh, older hard rock slash heavy metal bands that followed the hair metal trend at the time. No argument there. It's because we're talking about Priest, Sumerian Ape, the only good thing about Turbo is the solo on the title track. Uh, El Lojo del Paeso, something like that. I remember when Turbo came out. I was 16. I cried so much. Hated <laughs> so much. I think I cried too. Uh, Dollface. Uh, hard fucking no on Turbo. I think that's what it's supposed to mean. Replace Turbo with a fucking Budgie album. <laughs> Dave Mustaine would agree, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Priest supported Budgie in the old days. I mean, they were, Priest, Budgie was bigger than Priest. When are we going to do a Budgie yeah, episode on Lark Horns? Let's get Martin back for that one. Uh, okay, Turbo, the great, well, maybe not the great divider, because I think generally we haven't undone yeah. the, 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 the master narrative that Turbo leaves a lot to be desired for uh, the dyed-in-the-wool Priest fans. But anyway, yeah. Lisa. I'm glad we got to give you your opportunity to defend Turbo in the chat, but uh, since I have to live here and work here, we're not putting it in the top five because <laughs> yeah. I can't deal with that. Yeah. Well, there you go. So we've got five up at the top. Painkiller, Killing Machine, British Steel, Sad Wings of Destiny, and Screaming for Vengeance. But Lisa, we really haven't talked about anything post painkiller i guess sure and some people think we could just wrap the show right now but there's a lot of albums uh that have come out since 1990 and we will have an opportunity for you to tell us what you think about them there is a poll on the banger tv uh youtube page community uh about your favorite album uh from that era and if we actually pull up that graphic you'll see that most of you mm. think if anything is worth talking about it's angel of retribution so let's start there there you go okay well martin you touched on this in the opening mm -hmm. uh it's the halford return yeah a uh, big moment it's like you know for the maidens fan it's the brave new world uh record and that that means a lot to to, to fans but uh Tell me about this record in particular. Yeah, I, th I think the thing I like about it the most is that it does have a lot of variety. They do take some chances on it. And I also like that the production is kind of analog-y. It's, it's a little old school. I mean, that, you know, again, they, they correct big time because these are very mechanistic sounding albums. You know, in the same way, oddly enough, that Defenders and, and Screaming, and then there's more correction going on there. But um, so it is, it is a record that uh, basically, you know, maybe there's some learning from, from the Halford situation. It's a pure heavy metal album it does take some chances it's got a super long song on it as well um, it, it was it was a good return to form I I personally wouldn't put it super high I mean not to give anything away but out of, out of all these I'm, I'm really liking firepower the most mm. um, but um, yeah I, I, I think it was a good return it was a good way to jump back in there with uh, with Rob in the band um, yeah, I, 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 I do quite like it, okay. and obviously, yeah, they're, you know, the fans are really liking it. Okay, let's go to the board and see what people have to say uh, about Angel of Retribution. Very well, little. Okay, well, Horror Master, we got one comment. Or Angel of Death, uh, Retribution was the perfect way for Rob to come back to the band. 
vocal range was better than even uh, Hellbent for Leather. Leather, when I first heard the album, I thought to myself, are we back to the 80s? So it's really just one comment on this album, Lisa, oh, that we you're got, finding? We got one more. We got one Mostly more. Mostly people want to talk about... in. Well, this is definitely not going to be a contender for the top five. Rybrad28 says, Angel is their best post painkiller album. Not as good as Brave New World by Iron Maiden, thank you, would agree, uh, which is just uh, a masterpiece, but better than any Tim album. Uh, so that seems to be pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but would you agree that it's the best album post Painkiller? No. Excluding the latest? Uh, excluding the latest, yes. Yeah, yeah I would, okay. I would. I mean, right. Redeemer's pretty pretty darn good too, yeah. but um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I, I thought it, it took some chances. It, it wasn't the expected. You know, Halford was a little more of the expected, at least mm -hmm. the first Halford, and we all loved that. Um, so maybe they were just looking to, to uh, spread their wings a little bit. Oh, <laughs> on that note, we're moving on uh, from the dad joke. Uh, Lisa, <laughs> what's next? What are people saying? We're gonna give Less than 60 seconds to this. Okay. We're going to talk about Nostradamus. Nostradamus. Here we go. Thrash Maniac 99. My vote for must, most underappreciated Priest album would be Nostradamus. Yes, it was long, but I like the ambitious concept and songs like Death and Future of Mankind are among my favorite Priest songs. Justin Dickinson says Nostradamus is an amazing record and some of the best leads put down by Tipton and Downing since Painkiller. Uh, it gave us uh, three all-time classics too, Prophecy, Nostradamus, and Pestilence and Plague. And Laszlo says no to Nostradamus. Uh, just quickly, Martin, concept record, yeah. what do you think? I don't like the concept. I mean, I remember writing a essay on Nostradamus in high school. It is a high schooly type topic. It's been done before. I just found it a little bit like they're treating it too seriously. It's an hour and 40 minutes. The, the odd thing about it, and this is commendable, it's got very radical production. Mm. It's a little bit of that Glenn Tipton solo album, Baptism of Fire kind of production. Very mechanistic again. Again, they're just changing all the time, which is kind of cool. Um, that's You could you could talk about pre-production uh, and, and a whole episode for sure almost, but, good point um but no i i just found uh, the concept a little bit forced a little bit too um i don't know it, it belabored the, the songs are a little bit too mid pacey i agree that there are amazing leads on it not a big fan okay lisa how are we gonna do this we're running out of time we, we have about 10 minutes left we really are running out of time uh and if we don't talk about staying class um i'm gonna run out of time like on the <laughs> okay. So, uh, Stained Class did not get enough uh, early advanced votes right. in our poll. That's okay. why we didn't make a space okay. for it. Okay, well, but, let's see uh, what people have to say, rules, at so. least uh, anecdotally. Jeremy Dibble, are we really not going to talk about Stained Class? Are you fucking kidding me? Ben Brower, Stained Class. Less Binks on the kit gave Priest an actual groove that they kind of lost when they went on full studs and chains. Not their heaviest. Uh, the guitar tones are more 70s and restrained. Uh, their most varied and interesting album, in my opinion, Starbreaker, Exciter, White Heat, Red Hot. Just so many classics on that album. Paolo Pinkel, how can Killing Machine, Machine be in the top five? Here we go. And Staying Class is not. If you consider that Staying Class was voted number one album of 1978, yeah, you did that yeah, show. Absolutely. And Killing Machine <laughs> was only number three. Uh, yeah. Thrash Maniac 99, most underrated Priest album, Stained Class. Interesting, underrated. Want to hear your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Stained Class has many elements uh, to it that made it diverse beyond the realms of death. Is a, I love that. Proto-prog metal song. Exciter, fantastic. Uh, the first speed metal song. Go. Okay, so so this one, these two uh, are are paired. They both have that very thin, austere production. They're almost like a jazzy heavy metal band because their their neurons are firing so amazingly. They're coming up with incredible riffs, incredible playing. Um, Les Banks drumming, Simon Phillips drumming, Dennis McKay producing, Roger Glover producing. Yet, but yet they're a pair. They do have this. You know, I, I wouldn't say the guitar tones are thin. I'd say the guitar uh, the drum tones are thin, mm. and the entire production is very trebly. Super super smart. As I say, you know. Nothing, nothing compares. They, they literally sound like Jimi Hendrix parachuting in in 1960. Underrated? Uh, it is underrated, although a lot of those songs did show up on Unleashed, and they are classics. I mean, everybody does know Exciter. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Savage, uh, you know, there's Heroes End. Everything on there is, uh, and it is quite varied, but it is quite heavy. I disagree that it's not heavy. I mean, yeah. really, beyond the realms of death, is a power ballad with heavy parts, yep. um, and I believe there's one other short, completely mellow one. But everything mm -hmm. else is incredibly heavy. Savage might be, is incredibly. Might be heavy. jumping the gun here, mm -hmm. but do you think any of these should be replaced so far? Are you on board? 
Uh, Put me on the spot here. Anything deserve to be on the yeah, top five? I, I'm on board because I, they all speak to different eras. But you don't want to put Turbo in yeah, here? Yeah, no, don't want to put Turbo up there. But, I mean, uh, Stained Class, I mean, to me, this is the, these two are, are the smartest, most creative. But if we use the word legend, yeah. this should be. But when yeah. we talk about everybody's favorites, I love how the favorites are all over the board because yeah. Priest has proven to be something for so many different generations and for so many different reasons. Yeah, it's true. We've got at least three decades uh, represented here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 70s. 80s yep. and 90s. Yep. Okay, Lisa, uh, anything else? I don't know. It feels like we're kind of settling into uh, a verdict here on the top five. Uh, is, is, there is, staying, is staying glass in there? It's, it's in there? not. It's not. But that's just because uh, Pop Pop says it shouldn't be. Uh, I don't know. Much. Well, Pop Pop's being overruled by the yes. chat. Yes, my, my my vote is. I mean, this is this is not getting a lot of votes for whatever okay. reason, you people. So, um, but um, that could be. A, I I could. Say, I know this is getting a lot of votes. Is as that well. what Defenders we did? I'm actually. I was going to say. I'm surprised Defenders hasn't come up. I mean, Patrick mentioned it briefly in his clip, but. Uh, Defenders of the Faith get any love in the poll, Lisa? I'm a bit surprised because it was yeah. a big record commercially yeah. for well, the band and sort of at the height of the, the music video era, which is important yeah. as well. We did have some very smart comments about yeah. Defenders, but there's an overwhelming demand for Stained Class. So we did a poll, uh, okay. Stained Class versus Killing Machine. Ouch. And you can see here that wow. it's, uh, Martin, <laughs> you lose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love Stained Class too. It's one of my favorite albums of all time. But I just I just love the, 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 the more aggressive metalness of Killing Machine and the and the slight transition into that stronger, more memorable songwriting. Yeah. If I, we take it off, will you come back still another absolutely. time and be on yeah. our team anyway? Sure. We bring you here because you're the contrarian. I mean it is good for a good 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 fuel for the fire. Yeah. Okay Lisa, what do you think? I'm gonna call that our top five. You're calling it the top five. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. In a shocker, painkiller voted the legend I was anticipating it would be up here, not the legend. Still up for debate. Yeah. Stained class, uh, not not surprised there. British Steel, not surprised no. at all. Sad Wings, really not surprised. Not surprised. And Screaming for Vengeance, not surprised. Not surprised. Although personally, no. I thought maybe Defenders would actually give Screaming for Vengeance a yeah. bit of a run because I think for a lot of people, those are kind of a pair, like you were talking about some yeah. of the earlier records. This went double platinum too. This is their biggest selling uh, studio album. This went platinum, I believe. This went gold. This eventually went gold. They had a, they sold a lot of records. I yeah. mean, a lot of this stuff did well, but this this was the big one because you got another thing coming. Yeah. Okay. There you go. We've done it. We've done the top five, but we haven't done the show. We have five minutes left. Okay. And we're giving it to Martin. Okay. We said he would come on if we let him tell everyone <laughs> why Judas Priest belongs in the Rock Hall of Fame. It's the throne speech. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, so I write for Gold, my magazine. I love the magazine. Uh, in the past, I've, I've written one of these things for Yes and for Deep Purple. Uh, just a short little explanation why they should get in. Those two bands did get in. Priest was nominated, but they didn't get in this yeah. last time, right? So, okay, so my reasoning in a nutshell is, is this. They've been around forever. They've been around since 1969. They're as old as Black Sabbath is. They're, wa they're one of the oldest bands going, period, that's still going super strong, let alone in heavy metal. Um, you know, so they come along, they do with, with um, Sad Wings of Destiny, essentially uh, completely uh, make metal smart and cool mm -hmm. and, and just intellectual again. They, they have this great run of albums in the 70s. They go on to be one of the big bands of the 80s. So they're, they're out there um, participating, uh, playing arenas, um, you know, selling lots and lots of records. Uh, the, the, people forget how many records these guys sold. Like, they've done better than Black Sabbath. They've done better than Iron Maiden when it comes to records. Iron Maiden is the big ticket band and the band everybody talks about. Yeah. But these guys had 10 studio albums in a row that went gold or platinum. The two live albums went platinum and then gold for Priest Live, the 86 yeah. one. Um, um, so, so they're in there, they're making a lot of changes as they go too. They're teaching us about songwriting. They got Rob Halford, who is this, this first operatic vocalist. He's, he's gay, he comes out. Um, they, at the same time, they're the band that um, is creating the entire package of, uh, of what it means to be heavy metal. They're almost like the grandfathers of the new wave of British heavy metal with the whole look, the leather and studs look, uh, the, the anthems about metal like United and Take on the World. Um, 
And as time goes on, you know, they have their low moment in the 90s, but, uh, but they come back with Rob Halford. And so they're a band that is still participating. They're still headliners. They've basically been headliners since 1980. Um, so they've been doing all these important things for music, the, the, the creativity, the singing. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also, uh, they're also still participating, still changing. As we talked about, you could, you could have a whole class on just what they've done with production yeah. through the years. They've gone away and done solo albums. Yeah. Um, and they're out there now with a super strong album again. They're going to be touring. They're going to be playing uh, arenas and stadiums again. They're on packages. You always see them on festivals. They're just a ubiquitous, huge, amazing, influential band. As, as Derek and a lot of these people have talked about, and I've interviewed 1,600 interviews with metal guys, and they always talk about Priest, and they, they could have this entire discussion, too, about Sad Wings. I would agree. These I, records change people's I lives. i got to jump in. Uh, for me, it, there's three points you made that I think really boil it down. One is, a b there's very few moments in the history of music where you can say with crystal clarity that a band actually ushered in a new style of music, and that's heavy metal. We've talked a lot, me and you, about you know Sabbath and Zeppelin and Purple and how there was a new sound but they were still they still had one foot uh, in in the sort of 60s uh, rock moment the other thing undeniably Rob Halford's voice yeah. one of the best ever regardless of musical genre and third the longevity a consistent output since 1969 to today and yes they had their ups and downs but they're still actually doing it and i think judas priest uh like a few other bands really get a short end of the stick in the sense that people associate them with really just one moment in their history and for many that's either it seen it's for me it's like the british steel through to defenders of the faith where they kind of became a very popular band they had videos and then everybody else uh, everybody moved on whereas uh the band actually moved on to create some great yeah, records I mean, briefly i mean they they did yeah. have a few singles sure. that's that's another big thing yeah. some pretty big songs that a lot of people know also the twin lead thing they yeah. kind of started that even yeah. before maiden they're doing a certain kind of twin lead, but also just very smart, noisier Absolutely. twin leads between KK and Glenn. Um, yeah, yeah, just yeah. all those points combined. Uh, just, uh, just a very cool, a lot of academic stuff and a lot of success. And yep. the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame wants to see success. This band sold a lot of tickets and a lot of records. Good. You heard it here. Let's move on. In the few minutes we have remaining, what's the deal with that record? I love it. I I think it's great. Um, the certain things. Let's talk about what I don't like about it. First of all, well, is we're, talk, it is, we're talking about firepower. Yes, yeah, so we're talking about firepower. The new priest album that's out in a week or so, or something no, like hours, that. I, hours <laughs> today. Okay, <laughs> tomorrow. So so basically, um, I it is very well produced, very slickly produced. I'm not. I wasn't crazy about the first couple of singles, but I love what happens in the second half of the album. There's a lot of cool melodies. Rob's singing. I mean, he he has a lot of different voices. He's that thespian actor guy that he's been yeah. across a lot of these albums. So his singing's great. The lyrics are great. The production is really interesting and cool. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of interesting leads and guitar work. But I really like the melodies, the transitions, the pre-choruses, the choruses. I don't like the songs where it sounds like it could be any power metal band. Mm -hmm. And and you know, the, the big the big band people talk about like that is is Saxon or Accept. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of half of the album. Had the super heavy ones could be interchangeable with a lot of power metal bands, right. younger ones, or even like I say on a Saxon album. Yeah. So, but there there is a lot of cool, um, you know, melody and dimension to the record. I think it's a great, great. Right. I'll weigh in briefly. I mean, yeah. I mentioned at the outset. You know, to me, there's two types of metal fans. There's Maiden fans and there's Priest fans. I've always been a little bit more on the Maiden side of the yeah. fans, full admission. And I, so I'm not as familiar with the band's catalog in more recent years. I did spend a lot of time this week listening to Firepower, and I was actually really impressed uh, with the songwriting. Um, there's a few weak tracks in there. Uh, it kind of loses my attention a few times, but all in all, it actually is quite strong through yeah. to the very end. And I think the guitar playing is really, really strong. I think what you're talking about, the power metal thing, there's a bit of a feedback back loop happening now where Priest either consciously or not are absorbing much more modern power metal and probably even though they kind of invented it in the first yeah, plate it's absolutely. kind of starting to feed back and yeah. they're kind of Good interpreting point. something that they created and then putting it back out yeah. there if that makes any sense yeah. uh, but I think all in all it's it's actually a really uh, strong uh, record and I think you know I think Priest fans the core priest fans will really like uh, this record. That's yeah. my that's my sense uh, from it. That's it. 
We did it, guys. We did it. We made we it. We did it. All right. Thank you, sir. Yes, Thanks thank to Mark you. Popoff, That's Daniel, fun. Lisa, Craig, and Andrew, and everyone out there. Thank you for uh, joining us. This is actually a wrap on Lockhorns for this season of Banger TV, except we've got one more episode in our back pocket in the works, and we'll be announcing a date soon. Uh, a last reminder. Please subscribe uh, to Banger TV and help us continue to grow the all-metal channel. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you uh, next time. Bye for now.